So yeah, our next speaker is Tom Robertson, another fantastic past speaker. If any of you remember some procedurally generated whales from several years ago, um, as well as a past uh, IRDC speaker from our, the pre pre predecessor to this conference that I ran many, many years ago. And he's talking about a very fun topic, a new understanding of procedural super attacks. We already mm -hmm. had some talk earlier about juice and like really fascinating, funky little uh, things. And I think this will be a fun dovetail into that. So Tom, take it away. Great, yes, absolutely. You can hear me okay, right? Yep, you're great. Excellent, okay, well, yes. Actually, I saw the that juice presentation and I did think it was synergistic with my presentation. Uh, let's get right into it because, you know, it's a short situation. Um, I wanna make sure that's, that has no audio because I just wanna show the video. Um, the key here is that many years ago, I played Final Fantasy VII, and, uh, and I was astounded by all the super special final limit break attacks that each and every character and monster seemed to have. I knew how much work this all took, and I said, this is what you get when you can hire 100 artists to work for your game. You know, Pokemon has a move list of 826 moves. That's, you know, 826 possible attacks that a Pokemon could do. And each one has a unique graphical presentation in the game. Of course, we roguelike devs just don't have the resources to do that kind of thing. <clears throat> but we can use proc jump. In fact, it's one of our super attacks, if you see what I did there. So in this quick talk, I'll show you how I set up to make a proc gen super attack system and what I actually came up with and lessons learned. I want to emphasize that uh, that I'm not done. I haven't found any magical perfection. This is a work in progress for me. Sorry, I'm looking over here to my uh, script instead of looking you in the eye. And I'm eager to learn what some of you have already solved this problem in some better way. And that and that will make me say, of course, when you tell me, oh, Tom, we just did it the red way. And I'm like, oh, why didn't I do it that way? So that's, you know, story of my life. So... Um, you can see that big super attack presentations are made up of atomic pieces that are chained together. It's helpful to think and build in terms of atomic pieces. You don't get overwhelmed if you focus on each little piece. Each piece is mixed and matched with others and assembled into a complete super attack. So in code, I learned long ago that the atomic pieces should be added to a list. And the list, you know, took responsibility for ticking and drawing each atomic piece. And when the atom had reached its end, the list removes and deletes the atom. This is a good way to easily handle this chained kind of concept of how attacks work. So if you want a special effect, you just create several atoms and throw them onto the list and they'll be done in their own time. And one of the most powerful aspects of this concept is that those atoms can create other atoms and add them to the list too. So for instance, a projectile atom could create an explosion atom when it reaches its destination, which is pretty cool, pretty flexible. So many times in your code, you'll want the game to wait while the super attack is happening, or you'll want the input to be inhibited. Now, um, you know, uh, we were just watching at the beginning this uh, great talk about, um, about uh, juice and how one of the key concepts of, of juice is to not hold up the player, not stop the player from moving. But super attacks are a little different. They're a big deal. They're, they stop everything while the attack happens. Um, and that's just how like Final Fantasy style super attacks have always been. So that's certainly what I was thinking of. There are obviously ways to skip or forward fast, and that's what you would do to, you know, to, uh, to handle that requirement that you don't hold the player up. Um, but um, but if, but you're still going to want the input to be inhibited. You, you want to, the, you know, the attack is happening and then you want to stop the keyboard until the attack's over. And that's just checking to see if the, uh, if the atomic list, the, the atom list is empty. I mean, it's just, you know, if the list is empty, go ahead. If it's not empty, well, some sort of super attack is happening. So now the trick is, is the list blocking or concurrent? And by that, I mean, uh, so if there are three attack elements in the list, attack atoms in the list, are they being drawn at the same time? 
or is the top one being drawn and then the other two wait their turn until the top one's done? Uh, well, weary traveler, why not both? Uh, my learned experience is that you should make a concurrent list and a blocking list, and each one can contain attack atoms, and each one draws and ticks each atom they contain, and you could put atoms in either list. That solves problems that come up when you're building these really complex super attacks. So, all right, that's enough of that sizzle. I'm going to show you something else here. So this is a picture of a diagram on my whiteboard. I've had this picture up on my whiteboard for far too long as I've thought carefully about how my code pro procedurally generates super attacks. I knew many of the steps and tried to break it down into as many steps as possible so I could understand it better. But I came up with a theory of a basic trio, the dictionary, the choreographer, and the director. So the dictionary is like a Pokemon move chart or a spell book. It lists all the available super attacks in the game. Um, and units choose which of these attacks they can do from the, from the dictionary list. Um, the dictionary object itself is supposed to procedurally generate that list. And then there's the choreographer, which builds the super attack out of all possible pieces or atoms. So it creates a script of pieces. And then there's the director, which executes the script, which executes the super attack over time. For the, say, four seconds the super attack is on the screen, the director draws and changes the pieces according to the script. The director actually is the piece of code that shows the attack to the player. So the key insight I got from this diagram that's been sitting on my whiteboard for so long was that the director knows all about the pieces or the atoms, but some of them can inform the dictionary so that the dictionary can generate its list of attacks. So, I'm going to scoot on down here, and I'm going to actually fire up my test code base and get that working. All right, so, um, so this is my current implementation working of my test bed for super attacks. For each broad type of attack, the dictionary built five attacks for power levels one to five. The director knows in my code now of three atoms that it showed to the dictionary, so the dictionary defined a total of 15 attacks, which the demo is cycling through right now. So uh, there actually isn't a choreographer object. I didn't make a choreographer object. I wound up making a, a function in the director object called choreograph. So I'm not sure if that's exactly the way to do it. It's just, it's been worked out for me for this test bed. Um, and in doing this test bed, I learned that, um, you know, the most important thing I, did while hammering this all out is kind of something I already knew, which is you should make it easy for yourself. Once I had the structure in place and it was easy to add a new effect atom, I immediately started making new atoms and I had fun doing so. Uh, if it's difficult to add a new fire effect, you're not going to get around to it. If it's easy, you do it right away and then you go, oh, I'll add an ice effect too. So set yourself up for success. And this kind of structural piece parts way of making special effects uh, can support that goal of setting yourself up for success, making it so that the individual pieces are easy to make and easy to integrate with the rest of the system. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my code here, but I'm not going to get too deep into it or too crazy. Um, I have my... Uh, uh, Okay, uh, everything's good. So um, this is my uh, attack handlers table. Each of these second arguments here is essentially a function that does the particular job. Um, and I've got essentially around it a bunch of text tags to you know, help the, uh, the code process how this thing works. Notice again, that these top three have a middle tag suggesting that they're the bit that goes between the source and the target. And those are the ones that kind of the dictionary can latch onto and say, I'll make special, I'll make attacks that use these. Um, so uh, over here in attack dictionary, I have my attack dictionary object. It's got my setup and shutdown, my tick and my draw. It's got a list of attack records. Here's my attack record definition. Got my name, the color, um, 
tie list of tags. Here's the level of the attack and the seed. That's the random seed, so that when you hand off the attack record to the choreograph function, it's always going to generate the same attack. Um, and this little link to AH record is actually a link to what we were talking about, that middle attack atom that kind of defines what the attack is supposed to be. Um, so now I'm going to look at attack director's definition. Here we are with attack director. It's a class. Got my setup, got my shutdown, got my tick and my draw. Here's my choreograph function. Not sure if we'll have time to dig into it, though. Um, look, I've got my blocking list and my concurrent list, um, just like I was talking about. I'll use them and operate on both of those. Uh, and then I've got a bunch of maps uh, to map keys to code. Um, and I use maps all the time in conjunction with string keys specifically because it, it makes it very easy to, uh, uh, to, to say, hey, tell me about the middle ones or tell me about the red ones or tell me about the whatever. Um, it's just an elegant way I've found to, to organize the, the systems I'm building. And then, of course, here is the actual data block. It's the data of the actual uh, atomic special effect that is currently being played. When I create it, I add its handler, um, it, the source and target units, you know, who's shooting at who, couple colors, and the start time. Um, and just, you know, this is all generally data, but this is interesting because this is a flag saying, you know, when this when this particular special effect is done, you know, it took its half second or four minutes or whatever, uh, or four seconds, then uh, it just raises its hand, sets this flag to true, and then the outer system says, okay, well, we'll remove you and delete you and move on to the next attack. And just, you know, functionality-wise, um, I let... Uh, the game attach other blocks to this block so that when this block is dead and done, these children that were kind of being carried around by it get moved into the concurrent list so that they can all happen immediately. Um, so, you know, I could go on about code and it probably would be good to do so, you know, in the larger chat stuff, but I really just wanted to show, you know, the, the functionality of what I've been talking about. Uh, you know, this is not a finished job by any means. This is just me hammering on this problem of, I want a lot of really cool, special, unique attacks, and I want to procedurally generate them. How do I do that? So I hope we can find each other and, and talk some more throughout the con. And I think that's all I need to say. Excellent. Thank you so much. That was gorgeous. That was fantastic. Um, yeah, and it's great having a live demo, like right out, you know, doing it live right in front of all of us. I think we're all very happy to see it. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're around at the top of the hour, um, you've been assigned to the breakout room warrior. So if you want to talk more code details, more implementation stuff, more examples like that, may, perhaps you'll be there. That would okay. be great. I'm happy um, to be at warrior. Yeah, and um, some people were asking, and this might be a something you bring to Warrior later, of like titles of some of those games that you showed off in terms of like really ridiculous, splashy oh, yeah. mm -hmm. um, super attacks. It looked like there was a lot of them, and some of them seem fairly obscure. So I think it would be fun to just share what those are. Sure. And also, people asked about the status of the whales from several years ago. <laughs> uh, many of us missed them and love them dearly. <laughs> Well, I hate to disappoint people, but as much as they were impressive to the roguelike celebration crowd, they weren't impressive to anybody else. Um, you know, he, you know um, one of your previous uh, people giving the talk on uh, um, on the Shattered Pixel Dungeon, you know, he he talked about how he'd managed to push past the morass, push past, push out of that kind of zone where games languish and don't get any attention. Yeah. And I got to say. You know, I, you know, my whale game never pushed past it. My whale game yeah. never found the audience that I was looking for. Well, here's to hoping that in the future it will find it will find its niche. It will find its people. But yes, thank you so much for 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 showing off uh, your stuff. That was mm -hmm. absolutely incredible. 